No, 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 we're streaming. I'm going to start recording, I guess, and we can start the meeting. Okay, good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining the City of Kingston Planning Board at our monthly meeting. Today is Monday, May 17th. 2021. My name is Suzanne Cahill. I am the planning director for the city of Kingston and the organizer for our virtual meeting. Before we begin our meeting, I would like to go over a few meeting guidelines to help us navigate the system as efficiently and respectfully as possible. We ask that members of the public and the press be included and off camera for the length of the meeting. As the organizer, I reserve the right to mute anyone who unmutes themselves. Board members and staff will control the button. As good practice, we ask you to speak yourself if you are not speaking to avoid background noise and feedback. If a board member or staff wishes to speak, they will raise their hand. The chairperson will call on them before they speak by stating their name clearly for our audio listeners. The board member will then unmute themselves, state their name, and speak clearly, muting after finish. All of our meetings are recorded. Both video and written transcriptions will be available to the public on the city website at a later date. The meeting is also being live streamed on City of Kingston YouTube channel. In lieu of public speaking during the monthly meeting, we requested all comments to be received by 2 p.m. on Friday, May 14, 2021. Comments could have been emailed to Suzanne Cahill, Planning Director at skhill at kingston-ny.gov mailed or placed in the drop box outside of City Hall. Written comments have been posted on the city website and provided to all board members in advance of the meeting. We ask persons wishing to speak to contact the office in advance of the meeting so as a public hearing is called, those who have already indicated they wish to speak will be called upon first. For all those who are joining by audio and did not pre-register but wish to speak for a hearing matter, please text the following number, 845 Four four three zero four one six, with your name and the agenda item number and address. Again, text your name and the item number and address of the public hearing you wish to speak on to 845-443-0416 if you wish to be called to speak for a public hearing. If you have audio issues, please send a text message to that same number, 845-443-0416. I will repeat the number again, but be aware that phone calls will not be answered during the meeting. The number to text is 845-443-0416. As the organizer for today's meeting, I reserve the right to lock and pause the meeting to eject anyone who has behaved inappropriately or to enter into attorney-client conference if needed. Materials for this meeting may be found on the City of Kingston website, www.kingston-ny.gov. Once on the home page, click on Government and Services tab, select Planning Projects, and then Planning Board. At this time, I'm going to announce the I that items number three, which is 264 Lucas Avenue, Bluestone Commons Multifamily Project, and item number eight, number 79 Hurley Avenue, reuse of Daily Freeman Building for commercial multi-use, are both being postponed for the June agenda or possibly other special meeting if needed. Thank you for your patience during these difficult times, and on behalf of the planning board, I wish you and your family good health. In absence of, I now turn the floor over to Chairman or Chairman Wayne Platt to call the meeting to order at 6:05 p.m. Wayne, can we just clarify? Does any, could anyone hear what Sue just said? Because I could hear basically one out of every five words. I, I heard everything clearly. I was able to hear her. Okay. I was able. I was able to hear. Dan, what, what do you need repeated? I mean, that's probably difficult to say. but Well, it's something? the same thing that Sue says every month, so I don't need anything repeated. I just wanted to clarify whether there were audio issues because, um, you know, she was barely coming in, and I texted Kyla, and Kyla said she was having issues hearing her as well. Uh, okay. It sounded muffled to me. I could hear it, but it just sounds more muffled than usual. I agree. It sounded muffled, but I turned my volume up. This is Vince. It was muffled to me as well. 
Okay. Uh, uh, is it better? I'll it's try and speak muffled. louder. Okay. I'm, I'll turn my volume up. Is that better? It was the same with me now or before. So, but is everybody yeah, else? Pretty much there? exactly the same. I, you know, very, very, you know, very, you know, extremely muffled. And, you know, words fading in and out, but we, uh, you know, we deal as we can. Is anybody on live streaming right now? They can tell if, if we've had issues with that right now. I don't know. Probably not anybody on this board is live streaming, but uh, we'll just move on, I guess. We'll, we'll be. I I am on two computers tonight um, because I've talked to Kyla that or Kyle about doing something differently. But let me go off of the big computer and go to my small surface and see if that makes a difference. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. 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 Is that better? Yes. yes. That's better. Okay. Wayne? Yes, I can hear you. We're ready, we're ready to go. Can you hear me, Stu? Yes. Okay. I had to turn the volume up on this one. All right. We're ready to go then? Yes, we are. Okay. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the May 17th, 2021 City of Planning Board meeting. Um, we will begin with introductions. My name is Wayne Platt, Jr. I'm the chairman. We also have Charles Palaco, Robert Jacobson, Matt Gillis, Kevin Roach. Kevin, congratulations on becoming a full member there. Thank you, Wayne. All right. Um, Vince Archer. And we have our newest member, uh, Emily Hamilton. Welcome. If you're there, I think you're there. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Okay. Hi there. Hi. <clears throat> okay. We also have uh, Sue Cahill, Suzanne Cahill, Planning Director. Kyla D. Day is the Assistant Planner. Uh, Alderman Don Tollerman is here. He's the Common Council Liaison to the Planning Board. Daniel Gartenstein is Assistant Corporation Counsel. <clears throat> Item number one on the agenda is the adoption of the April 19th, 2021 and April 26th, 2021 Planning Board meeting, transcripts and decisions. Everybody's had uh, those items delivered to them. Any questions, concerns, deletions, additions? Okay, hearing none, at this time, this is Wayne Platt. I'll make a motion that we adopt both of those planning board meeting just transcripts and decisions. Do I have a second? Kevin Roach, second. Second, second by Kevin Roach. All in favor? Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco? Yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Kevin Roach? Yes. That is adopted. Okay. Moving on to public hearings, item number two is number 301 Broadway. Uh, it's a special permit renewal to operate a gasoline station. Section block and lot is 56.34-8-4. Secret determination, zone C2, Broadway Overlay District, uh, Ward 9, Speedway LLC is the applicant and owner. Is there anybody besides the applicant or owner wishing to speak on item number two? Probably nobody there, Sue, right? I believe Alec uh, Glad is on. He's, rep he's with representing the applicants? Yes. Alec? Uh, uh, Alec? Okay. <clears throat> yes, hi. Good evening. Alec Glad from Cuddy and Fader, and we're the Land Use Council for the Applicant Speedway. How are you doing tonight, sir? Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, so um, staff had reached out to Building Safety for an update on the maintenance issues um, that was addressed in November 2020. There were some issues going on behind the the, uh, the building 
And so those have been taken care of? Yes, all of the issues that had been identified were addressed by the applicants appropriately. Okay. And I believe to the, sat to the satisfaction of engineering in our department and building. Okay. And so uh, I see there's 32 incidents from the police department. I mean, a lot of times uh, there are, you know, the police department, if they're out, in the, out on Broadway or whatever, they'll use the address that they're closest to, to, to show where they're at for that incident. Is there anything that jumps out at you with, with the incidents for this? Uh, not to me. Kyla and I both reviewed it. A lot of them uh, were traffic, you know, motor vehicle traffic violation stops. So okay. we believe that that's just the case, that they just referenced that as the property address where it occurred. Okay. Um, and Alec, there's no changes proposed for the property at all? Everything's the same? Uh, yes, minus just um, the improvement to the dry well. Uh, okay. The second one in repaving that back surface area, which, as you recall, was kind of a condition of the temporary six month extension that was granted last fall, ha has been completed. Um, so there's no other changes, and, and we're here this evening to request an additional five year renewal of the special permit at the site. Okay. And so, do we, I see in some of our notes here, do we need to confirm number of employees and hours of operation, or have you already done that? Um, if Alec can confirm that, or um, if he can't, he can submit that um, to staff after the meeting. Yes, I will submit that after. I don't know, have that information in front of me. Okay. Um, any questions from the board? This is Matt here. Um, yeah. I drove by the other day. I saw the dumpsters in the front parking lot. Was that to allow for the paving of the rear parking lot? Or the rear lot? Yes, I would imagine so. Um, and I and I have pictures that I that were taken. I think either Friday or today. Um, they look a little old because there's some debris from tree on there um, of the completed parking lot. If the board would like to see that, also. And we'll just, I guess, Matt, we'll just, we'll just keep an eye on that. Staff will keep an eye on that to make sure that they're, and they, and they probably are, Alec, they're probably back behind the building, probably. So um, we'll make sure that those, that, that issue is taken care of, right? Yes. Okay. okay. Um, I know uh, the most recent term was six months for the renewal on the special permit that just gave the applicant time to remedy the situate the, the issues that were outstanding. Uh, prior to that, uh, it was five years. Sue, do you have a recommendation for, or anybody on the board recommend uh, either going with a, maybe a three-year term or, or continue with a five-year term? I think three year would be reasonable. Um, and we'll just monitor um, obviously the dumpster issue, but we'll monitor the rest of the site and then reconsider when they come back for the renewal at, in three years. Is everybody good with that? This is Kevin, I agree. I agree. Okay. Matt agrees. Okay, it seems to be the general consensus. Okay, um, any other, anything else outstanding, Sue? Um, the only other uh, issue that we noted is that with the original um, approval, uh, we only had uh, policy, we want to include uh, policy 13 with all the others, uh, 4, 4A, 10, 11, 12, and 25. So policy 13 is changes to contact information. You're, you're needing that? Yeah. So we're going to include board policies 4, 4A, 10, 11, 12, 13, and 25 in this. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Okay. So under seeker, this is a type two action. So no further review of the board is required at this time. Um, at this time, I will make a motion that we approve item number two for a period of three years with all of the board policies that Sue had just mentioned to be included in that. And uh, do I have a second on that? Uh, Chuck seconds. Charles Polacco with a second. 
Um, all in favor, Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco is a yes. Robert Jacobson. Yes. Matt Gillis. Yes. Kevin Roach. Yes, sir. Okay, that is adopted. Alec, thank you for so much for joining us tonight. Just uh, if you, whatever we needed that Sue needed, you could just take care of that at staff level. We'd appreciate it, pal. Absolutely, we will do that. Thank you, Mr. All Chairman. Right. Members All right. Thank you. All right, have a good night. Okay. All right, as Sue mentioned, item number three is off the agenda for tonight, 264 Lucas Avenue. Um, moving on to new business, item number four is 139 Cornell Street. It's a site plan to install an additional curb cut for a loading slash unloading zone. Section block and lot is 48.334-5-13, secret determination zone C2, mixed use overlay district. It's in Ward 6, uh, Ulster County, New York State. ARC is the applicant owner. And who do we have here tonight? Scott Dutton is here and Dennis Larios. Okay. Welcome, fellas. Good evening. Good evening. Wayne, All right. Before you yeah. dig into it, um, we received uh, the Sue and Kyla's comments late this afternoon. And um, is Gary Bellows on and unmuted? Okay. Gary, are you on, Gary Bellow? He and I spoke uh, about 20 minutes ago and he was planning on attending. If you are on by phone, Gary, you would hit uh, star Oops. six to unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Great, thanks, Gary. Um, first of all, thanks for um, sending those comments out. <clears throat> You know, this has been bouncing around for a couple of years through various departments. Um, I think Gary would like to share his efforts going back about three years to try and um, negotiate with Verizon and um, any help that this board could um, bring to bear would, would be meaningful. And I, I think we're going to ask that after a brief discussion that we table this for tonight so that we have an, an opportunity to be, bring us all together and um, see if we can create the best outcome possible. Gary, do you want to tell us how, where you've been? Yeah, so thank you. Um, so in essence, uh, we got the idea to take the old work center from the ARC and uh, we went ahead and created uh, Cornell Creative Business and also Cornell Creative Arts Center. And so we have a entrance off of Bruin uh, for the business center, but for the art center, it is directly off of Cornell Street. And so um, as we started to look at it, we knew that we are both want people who are disabled and abled to be able to attend the art center. So we started down the path of uh, working with the city of Kingston to see if we could get parking along Cornell Street. Um, there was some discussion about that, um, that did not go any farther. So then we went and tried to talk to Verizon and, uh, they have not, uh, been the most, um, um, I guess, responsible, uh, neighbor in that they spoke to me once and then would never pick up the phone again. Uh, we tried to look to buy their lot in the back. And so for a last ditch effort, uh, we went ahead and a couple of years ago and approached the city on having a uh, turn off or cut through uh, for people who have disabilities, who might be in a wheelchair, walker, so, so they, they could disembark and go to the art center and take the class and then get picked up safely. And uh, there is no parking um, close. So anybody who in the winter time or raining or uh, sleet, any type of inclement weather, uh, 100 degrees or whatever, would have to probably walk two city blocks to get to um, the front door of the art center. So uh, we thought the turnoff might be the best solution. 
Um, but uh, if uh, we could have a little help in uh, approaching and actually getting someone from Verizon to actually return a phone call and uh, start a dialogue with us, uh, we'd certainly be happy to, uh, to take a look at that. Just to add to what Gary has shared, um, the ARC does not need and um, to acquire all of the Verizon property. What they were hoping for was an easement across the back of the property that would comply with the zoning ordinance for in and out um, <clears throat> traffic. So that would be a 24 foot at a minimum um, if we could get someone to, to see and appreciate that we think that it, it wouldn't impact them negatively um, to, to have a 24 or even um, a 34 foot wide so that we could get a row of uh, parallel parking and create additional parking opportunities in Midtown. Um, we just absent any response after numerous requests um, acting out of desperation to try and create these opportunities. Would anyone like, this is Kyla, would anyone like me to share uh, a map or some photos so you can see what is being talked about? Would that help? That'll yes, probably please. help. Yes, please, this is Kevin. Yeah, I'd just like to add that, you know, there was, uh, Gary mentioned it, but the plan to uh, edit parking spaces along that side of Cornell Street um, was, was actually rejected by the city, not by the planning board, but by, I believe, Public Works and the city engineer, because uh, it would involve restriping a lot of Cornell Street for probably three blocks. Um, that's why we're here, you know, uh, to create this, this pull-off area. Um, I had presented it to the city engineer and he, you know, the only quick comment he had was about drainage and there is a catch basin actually right by the, the pole on the south end. Uh, so I just have to add a note to make sure the pavement is pitched to that basin, but it, it, it is already. So uh, um, certainly can deal with, you know, address the city engineer's comment without a problem. This is Wayne Platt. Um, would, is there peak hours or times of the day where where folks would be dropping off and picking up in this in this proposed area? Um, well, classes. Uh, what we're looking for were classes to be held uh, during the day, uh, mainly for uh, people with disabilities, and then we were looking for uh, nights and weekends for um, people who are able. Uh, who could come in and take classes uh, also. So um, I think uh, I, I couldn't pin it down to exact hours. It would be how many students sign up for how many classes. COVID has kind of put a uh, wrinkle in our getting off the ground. So this is something that uh, we wanted to get off the ground within the next couple months. And the, the folks who would be coming here for classes, are they coming from group homes like in, in, a, in a van there's there'll be you know half a dozen at a clip maybe unloading and and or is it individuals in cars dropping off one at a time uh i suspect there might be some carpooling together but as you can imagine um not not everyone in a in a group home would probably want to go to uh, the same art class or at the same yeah. time so my guess is a uh, more individual cars than vans. Okay. This is Kevin Roach. If I may ask, if someone pulls up there right now with a van or a vehicle and just parks there, the car, engine running to let a, somebody out of the car, would it that be a problem or expected that they get a ticket or something? I. That's a problem because uh, for two reasons. One is there's not a safe stopping area uh, with uh, uh, with the street geometry uh, and the way the street striped. And two, there's there's not a handicap accessible ADA compliant route from where the drop off would occur to the to the the new door uh, entrance to the uh, creative uh, area there. Um, 
So right now, uh, there's not there's not a practical way to to be dropped off or picked up there if you you have a disability. Okay, so because there's no ramp type curb cut, they couldn't get off the street level. Yeah, there is a ramp, but it leads to the sidewalk. Uh, but there's nowhere to get to that sidewalk currently from a, a drop off vehicle for for someone that's disabled. This so that, Dennis, so so where where is the route now? What are, what are they doing now um, in lieu of there not be having any available spot there? Well, they probably uh -huh. have to wheelchair a block or two. Um, well, Dennis, can I interject here? Sure. The, the the center opened just before the pandemic, so it really hasn't fully realized. Um, it, it's normal uh, operations. So there is a new parking lot along the uh, the west side of the core center, um, but the route from uh, the handicapped spaces there, which don't really show up on this this uh, aerial photo, um, the parking lot was totally redone about two or three years ago. Um, but that would be the spot they'd have to be dropped off there and then they'd have to wheelchair around uh, two sides of the building, probably three or 400 feet uh, to get to this door or this entrance. So I, I think at this point, um, I'm going to ask, um, everyone to contemplate this, then we should table it for tonight, I think. Okay. And just know that anything that, any thoughts that you have about contacting Verizon would be appreciated. And if anybody does have a way for us to get to a person at Verizon, Gary um, you know, tried valiantly for well over a year. Okay. All right. Any other questions from the board? This is Kevin. One last question. There's no other way to get into the building from that parking lot without having to go back out on the sidewalk. Gary, do you want to describe uh, the um, state regulations there? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, we're, we're looking uh, at, there are other doors uh, off of Tenbrook where that parking lot is, but unfortunately um, we are regulated by OPWDD. Uh, that space is considered um, um, space which is certified and only people who are staff employees or someone uh, who has a disability uh, who is uh, assigned to a classroom or uh, another part of the building for uh, whatever their reason for the visit could go th through that space. Otherwise, uh, we could not have a random person with a, with a disability or uh, as, as a, uh, an able-bodied person, which we hope to have many uh, people in the community taking art classes there, they, they would not be allowed to come through that space. Um. Thank you. I was actually meaning more of the parking lot. I think it might be on Bruin instead of Tenbrook. There's a parking lot there. Is that your parking lot or? Right, that's where that is, where the arrow is. That's Verizon right. property. Yeah. That's the Verizon property. Actually, this photo was taken, uh, I think, during the reconstruction of, of the ARC parking lot. That's why it doesn't look much like a parking lot. Um, but it's that light gray area that connects the two streets. And then there's a nice drop off area, but as Gary said, it goes to a, a limited access controlled uh, environment. Yes. Um, I thought you were speaking of the Verizon building across the street, across Cornell. I didn't realize you were referring yeah. to the parking lot there. Yeah, that's Verizon. Part of it is a storage yard for materials and part of it is for parking for their employees. Thank you. But they, they were non-responsive also going back to Gary's predecessors because I worked in the parking lot project. They were also non-responsive at that time to the ARC. 
that goes back three or four years. And I think okay. it's more corporate bureaucracy than anything else. It's just, I think it, it's if we could get to the right person and present a solution to somebody that was receptive, it could be a win-win. But um, Gary's beat his head against the the wall there, and it's a complex building. You know, it's it's a it's a classic. Um, urban uh, industrial building that's been built out and renovated over time many, many times. And there are these anomalies um, that we see throughout the city that. Uh... Okay. All right. Um, all right. So at the, at the request of the applicant here, we're, uh, this is Wayne Platt. I make a motion that we table item number four. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Robert Jacobson. All in favor, Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco? Is a yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Kevin Rhodes? Yes. Okay, that is a, that is passed. Scott, Dennis, and Gary, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night. Thank you, Mr. Scott, you're sticking around right here. Yes, sir. Okay. Proposal. <laughs> item number five is 41 Pearl Street site plan amendment to add a gate and perimeter fencing section block a lot is 48.331-6-11 seeker determination zone 02 it's in the Fair Street Historic District it's also in Heritage Area Ward 2 Hudson Valley Kingston Development applicant owner uh, Scott you're here Solely for the represent, representing the uh, uh, Charlie's on. Charlie, can you oh, unmute yourself? I'm on. Thank you. Hello, Mr. Blakeman. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Okay. Um, show us what you got here, Scott. Well, w once again, uh, I want to thank Kyle and Stu for sharing their comments um, this afternoon. Charlie and I have discussed them. Um, the proposal is to install a, um, a gate and a fence at the property line for Fair Street and Pearl Street um, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, that uh, the lights from the cars coming into the uh, adjacent parking lot have, be have presented themselves as a nuisance to a guest. So we want to shield the, the guests on the east side of the building um, from the lights. The other is that as operations um, have started to understand activities at the site, there's a fair amount of lingering and loitering between the adjacent property and this property and a desire to, to, you know, to secure that space and elevate it, if you will, and make something that's, that's private and commensurate with the experience that they're offering. So that's the reason why you need a stockade fence so no lights can go through. So that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Right. And Charlie, do you want to talk about the the staining and the color of that and the and the, the little heart motif that um, I think you've changed your mind on. To yeah. to I mean, uh, the color, I mean, we're open to, but uh, I think, you know, something like the green and the trim of the building would, I think would work well, but uh, we're, we're certainly open uh, if anybody is objectionable to that. Um, and then you had a little change change of heart on the no pun intended on the heart. You, yeah, I think uh, uh, the, the the one that shows the uh, the third one on that same level. If you go to the right, yeah, that one I think maybe it's more in keeping in terms of like uh, lines of the building than the heart. But I, you know, that's also I'm open to suggestions if somebody thinks there should be something else. Yeah. And Wayne and members of the, the board, the thinking is that with the two very large gates that 
Uh, we've maintained the opportunity during the day, on weekends, when it's appropriate to have that space opened up and transparent. But when it wants to be um, closed off, that it can be closed off. Also, by having the large gates um, allows for traffic, um, <clears throat> meaning like snow plowing and vehicular traffic to, to pass through it if desired. But really, it, it started with the need here to, to block the lights from the east side, and then secondly, to block the, the loitering and the traffic. So the, this is Sue. So the gates are going to be at four foot, correct? Right. And the yeah, fence yeah. around the perimeter is six. And that those dimensions, those heights include that topper or yes. not? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. And we might have to customize to get that to work, but that's so that we don't have to go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Okay. Because Fair Street and Pearl Street are front yards. And the other two are side yards. And my personal architectural um, recommendation would be that it match the, the sort of rich green that's on the building now and has existed for as long as I've been in Kingston. Which one, which one are you inclined to bring to the Historic Landmarks Commission for their for their for their approval? I guess this one uh, that he's pointing to now. Okay. I mean, I don't I don't have a problem with that. Anybody else? I have no issue. I think what we should do is just defer to the landmarks. Um, yeah. Design board, review board. I, I can start. I'm hearing some background noise too. And there's a lot of people with open uh, mics, so maybe if you're not speaking. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so. We can just Sue just approve the concept right now, right? And uh, we'll we'll defer. And if the board, the rest of the board feels this way, we can re, we can defer to the to the landmarks commission uh, for final approval, right? Well, you would approve. Uh, you would approve the plan. Um, yes. You would defer the decision on color and on the topper design to a landmark decision. Okay. Do we have to specifically identify that? I think it was item number 300 on that stockade. Do we, do we, or we leave that up to landmarks? Whatever, whatever one they were pointing to. Landmarks. Okay. All right. Anybody? I'm about to make that a motion. We're gonna, I'm going to do a, a seeker first, which is type two. So no, no further review of the board is required. Anybody else have any questions? Okay, pretty pretty simple here. Okay, so this is Wayne Platt. At this time, I will make a motion that we uh, approve item number five um, with final color to be uh, decided by the Landmarks Commission. And also board policy six will need to be signed by the owner. Anything else to throw on top of that, Sue? Uh, yeah, final topper design. Okay, As the lattice part they're talking about, right? Yes. That's what I was referring to with uh, also throwing it to landmarks. So that is a motion. I heard Robert already seconded that one. Second. Robert, all right. Um, all in favor, Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco. Palacco is a yes. Okay. Robert Jacobson. Yes. Matt Gillis. Yes. Kevin Roach. Yes. Okay, that is that is approved. Thank Charlie, you, Charlie. Don't leave. Charlie, don't leave. We have one more. Oh, okay. Yeah, Wayne. Yeah. Uh, or Chairman, uh, we talked about possibly move since uh, um, Scott and Charlie are both here for number nine, fifty-nine Pearl Street. 
if the okay. board wants to address that, that's just for the Ulster County Planning Board comments. Okay. So it should be fairly quick. Go to uh, that is under old business, right? I'm going to throw that in. Uh, yes, old business number nine. Okay. Um, so item number nine is 59 Pearl Street in Perrin, 236 Wall Street. Site plan to establish professional office spaces and an event space. Section blocking lot is 56.91-3-1. Secret determination zone 02. It's in heritage area. Ward 2. Charles Blakeman of Kingston Ops 2 LLC is the applicant owner. So um, the Ulster County Planning Board returned the following required modification. They needed ADA parking. Um, Scott, you want to talk to that? Then what? how you dealt yeah. with that? Yes, I just want to uh, affirm and confirm tonight that we can provide the requisite ADA parking on site. Okay. And there are a couple of ways to do that. And I think that um, it, it rises to the level of being a staff. Yeah, which is what we did at the last meeting, really. So um, everybody good with having staff handle that with Scott and, the, and Mr. Blakeman? Okay. Um, all right. So at this time, I'll make a motion that we approve item number nine. With uh, well, actually, two. So do we have to um, vote to concur with uh, that? The, yes. That the modifications have taken place. Okay. Yes, we do. Okay. So I'll make a motion that we concur that the applicant will be um, addressing the ADA parking as per recommended required modification from the Elster County Planning Board. Uh, that is a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Robert Jacobson. Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco. Is a yes. Robert Jacobson. Matt Gillis. Yes. Kevin Roach. Yes. Okay, that is approved. Thank you, fellas, again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for hinting at that, Kyla. Uh, okay, moving on. Item number six, 219 Fox Hall Avenue is a site plan to construct an addition on an existing warehouse building. Section block and lot is 48.82-1-25, secret determination, zone M2, ward five, Emerton Broom LLC is the applicant owner. Okay, who, uh, who do we have here? Uh, this is Bailey Pottery. You want to unmute yourself? Thank you. And just introduce yourselves, please. Hi, I'm Ann Bailey. And I'm Jim Bailey. Hi, folks. Nice Ready? to see you. A while. Yeah, too long. <laughs> Okay, so expansion is good, right? We got, you, you know, we, we like to see businesses expand, right? And uh, why don't you tell us um, what your plan is here? Well, we basically um, keep running out of space, and we are so packed in our facility, um, we need to go vertical. And uh, adding the warehouse will allow us to stack three high, get a forklift in there be a lot more efficient and I consider it actually a safer way to manage everything we have. Okay. And um, it will allow us to keep growing and we're growing. We're definitely growing. And I'd like to say that that's the manufacturing <coughs> side of the business, that building on Fox Hall. And we don't have enough floor space for manufacturing. So a lot of the things that are being stored in the building already are going to be moved so that we improve our our uh, flow in the manufacturing okay. space. Kyla, do we have a rendering? Okay. We don't really have a rendering. We have um, kind of an idea of where it's going to be over in this location, correct? Yeah, yes. that's right. On this, on this side. 
So where it says 60 by 60, uh, the existing building, of course, is 60 wide. Um, those four rectangles you see um, kind of overlapped on one another. Those are right now the, uh, the trailers we're using for storage, but, and those would go. So um, yeah, so it'd be a 60 by 60 with an opening door to uh, Foxhall, the large bay that a forklift can drive into and then a walk-in door. I, I sent a sketch of that. Do you have that? Uh, let me check. If you look here, can you see that? Okay. Mm -hmm. All right, so that's what we would be adding on. If I've got that framed well enough, sorry. All right. It's important to know that we own the other building on the other side that you're looking at. If you're wondering if that looks like a tight space, we own the other building that goes out onto Tenbrook. That's the old Colony Liquor Building, right? You're talking yeah. about. Yep. Okay. Uh, Tyler. Yeah. Can you just bring up the parcel viewer map again, the satellite? Mm-hmm. This Rob? Yeah. So this new extension is going to remain on the parcel. Yes. Yes. All right, I, I don't see any issue with this. No. I'm good. Okay. Anybody else have any questions? This is Kevin. I'm fully proponent proponent of it. Okay. This is Matt. Looks like a great addition to this. Just a quick question, Jim and Ann. Um, is, does this mean any employment increases or? Uh, yes. Okay. Yeah, we've already added. Uh, I mean, it's phenomenal how busy we are. It's um, unbelievable. Okay. Good. It's a good thing we've already added about four jobs. Great. Mm -mm. And as Ann was saying, in our manufacturing, which is all uh, air conditioned in there, this allows us. Uh, a flow through to move a lot of the racks that are in prime location where we're manufacturing and move some of that storage into this side of the new building and that will open up for more employees and better organization on the other side. So uh, it's just um, ideal that it it's all aligned and the space is there quite frankly. It's pretty simple and sweet. Okay, good. Okay. Um, so this is Wayne. Under Seeker, this is an unlisted action. Uh, Kyla, uh, we have a short environmental assessment form prepared? Yes. Okay. And it, it is in order, I would assume. I'm sorry? No, I'm talking to Kyla. We're talking okay. about the short environmental assessment form. It's complete, correct, Kyla? We're good? Be confirmed. He's okay. saying yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. So at this time, I'll make a motion that we approve the uh, short environmental assessment form. That is a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Robert Jacobson. Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco? Is a yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Kevin Roach? Yes. Okay. Um, that is adopted. Moving on to, let's see here. I'm going to make a motion at this time that we approve item number six with board policy six, also four and four A. Um, anything else, Sue, that needs to be included in that? Um, the only other thing is, um, do you guys have a Knox box on that building right now on any of your structures? Uh, we don't. You mean at the front door? Uh, yeah, to so the fire something. to access in case of emergency. Yeah, no, we don't currently, but we could. Okay. 
I, w I would add that, Wayne. That okay. We'll throw that on there too. I agree. Okay. So we'll add, we'll add that policy on as well. That, that would be part of the motion. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Second by Robert Jacobson. Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Polacco? Yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Kevin Roach? Yes. Okay, that is approved. Ann and Jim, thank you so much for joining us. Continued success. We appreciate okay, it. Thank you all. Okay. Nice to see you. Really all right. Good night. Okay. Item number seven is 55 Foxhall Avenue. It's a site plan to convert an existing garage structure into, um, am I correcting that into three apartments, Kyla? Yes. Okay. Yes. Into three apartments. Section block and lot is 56.26-6-11. Secret determination zone 02, ward five. Courtney Green is the applicant. CPG Kingston one, LLC is the owner. Hi, I'm Courtney. That's oh yes. That's also me. I'm the owner and applicant. Okay. I didn't need to separate it out that way. Okay. Rob, did Robert? Right. You just yes. Yeah, I'm just. I want to just put on the record. I'm going to recuse myself from this application. I have not represented the uh, current applicant, but I represent the seller when the applicant bought, uh, knowing that this plan was on the horizon. So just for. Um, Okay. For clarity's sake, I'm just going to bow out on this one just to okay. be on the safe Sounds side. Good. Sounds good. So, Vince, you're in on this, okay? Okay. I think you heard me. Yeah, he was on his phone, but he's muted. Okay. All right. Um, okay. All right. Um, Ms. Green, why don't you tell us what you would like to do here? Uh, so I purchased this property in December of 2020. Um it was previously being used as the accounting offices of a small accounting firm since the early 80s. Um, it had been built as a single family residence in the late 70s and then taken over uh, by this accounting firm for the next 30 plus years. And they, or there was also this large garage building out back that was being used to house a bunch of contractors, uh, contractors equipment, but it's gigantic, like a school bus could go in there. Um, and, you know, not being, none of the site has been used to its highest and best potential in a long time. And when I first purchased the property, the intention was always to do this in two phases and to begin the conversion of the main house into three residential, uh, you know, multifamily apartments. And then given that this would require site plan approval, et cetera, sort of phase this part as the second stage of this. So currently uh, the main house is going to be complete in probably another month or so and uh, ready for move in. And now I'm looking to work on the equipment and it's a bit more complicated because it involves trenching to bring uh, water and sewage to the garage building and we're going to be paving uh, Prince Street in a few weeks, I've been told. And if we're going to do that, we need to do that ASAP. So just trying to get all my ducks lined up in a row here to create what will eventually be six beautiful, modern, uh, design-focused apartments out of this building without really disrupting the site at all. OK, good, good. Um, this is Wayne. Sue, I'm jumping ahead on the notes here. There's adequate parking on site for this. Uh, yes, as part of this, she has added uh, two additional spaces. Okay. Right. Yes, to bring the total to 12, which um, I believe is compliant for this. So the okay. 10, first 10 were already existing. So again, um, you know, trying to minimize digging and disruption. Okay. Um, also looking ahead here, I see... Um, there's going to be um, a recreation fee impact. Sue, what are we what are we looking at there? It would be six thousand dollars. Okay. <clears throat> and Ms. Green, you're you're aware of that, correct? I mean, you're probably I already aware. I saw the fee schedule that mentioned that for more than four apartments, each one was a maximum of three thousand. I wasn't sure if there's a minimum or maximum or how that rate gets set, but 
you know, whatever it is, it, it is. So, yeah, I mean, typically we've, and so we probably have to refer this over to, to uh, parks and rec. Is that, is that correct? Right. It's uh, the rec fee is based on if there is any on site um, recreational opportunity presented for the, for the, not only the, um, not only the uh, people that are going to reside there, but the general public. And in this case, obviously, that's a no. So um, in all likelihood, the full amount would, would get assessed. So that's yeah. why the 6000 And they, that's typically how the Parks and Recs ha has, uh, has responded to our, our uh, communications to them. They're going to they're going to um, want the maximum amount. So I'm, I'm assuming I would imagine they would do the same thing there too. So mm -hmm. um, also uh, you're aware of the um, affordable housing component needed 10% of, so what is, is that just one apartment then? Sue, yeah, 10% needs of five or six doesn't exist. Yeah. So I've been told that it would be one here, which is actually yeah. like more than 10%, but that's why I have added this addendum of a sixth unit. Okay. Help, um, mitigate the okay. losses. Okay. And garbage and recycling refuse, how's that going to be handled? I will have to see how it goes with it. This second portion is not going to be done for quite some time. So at first I'm only going to have three occupants and I am still not entirely familiar. I, I believe I'm going to have to get at least another bin for them and either put um, a little area up by the front of the driveway because I know from the previous owner the Prince, that Prince Street is where the trash goes for this building. So, um, you know, I, I don't know if I need to get three separate bins for three separate tenants. I know the city provides one, is that correct? And then you have to purchase additional ones? Right. I certainly don't want trash piling up. So, you know, however many are, are necessary. But as of now, the plan is to keep the trash um, under the overhang in the back, which you can't really see, but it's sort of um, on the garage side of the main house. There's a big sort of overhanging area by the cellar where the bins currently are. So my plan for now, at least, would be to keep them there and the tenants will have to take them out, you know, as the previous owners did and, and bring them back. Okay. Anything else, Sue? Um... No, just the board policies. All right. Does anybody from the board have any, any questions? Okay. Um, all right. So under seeker, this is an unlisted action. So uh, we will have to make a determination of environmental significance. Kyla, you have a short environmental assessment form, and it's in order at this time? Correct. Okay. So at this time, we'll make a motion that we approve that. Um, this is Wayne Platt. Do I have a second on that? This is Kevin Roach. I'll second. All right. Second by Kevin Roach. Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco? It's a yes. Uh, Matt Gillis? Yes. Kevin Roach? Yes. Vince Archer? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That is, a, that is adopted. Uh, so at this time, I will make a motion that we um, adopt, approve item number seven uh, with, so you want to go down, you've got a laundry list there. It'd be better if you did it. Okay. Uh, but, uh, well, board policies 6, 12, 14, 18, 18A, 22, 25, and 26 uh, with a recreation fee of $6,000 and incorporating one affordable unit under the city code. Okay. Okay, uh, that is a motion. Do I have a second on that? Second it. Second by Charles Polacco. Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Polacco? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Kevin Roach? Yes. Vince Archer? Yes. Okay, that is approved. Ms. Green, thank you very much for appearing. Con uh, good luck on your project. Thank you. Hope you all come see it when it's done. Very okay, nice. we will. Thank <laughs> you. Can I ask a question? Sure. How does the affordable housing unit get marketed? How Who oversees that? How does that work? 
Going... Seems there are a lot of questions that there aren't necessarily answers for yet from my <laughs> questions, but <laughs> am I wrong there? <laughs> Just that I need to make it and it has to happen, but. Right. I mean, you as, a, as an owner of, of a property that's new, more used to market rate housing, how do you have the knowledge to market? I, I don't know that most small business landlords like myself would. I right. think will be that's a my question. Yeah. I have had a discussion with Chuck at Rupco about potential voucher um, use to, to collaborate with them and take, you know, voucher candidates right, or, you could do that. or just figuring out because there really isn't an existing mechanism for affordable housing with small, you know, private landlords. Uh, it's, right. a, it's a very different beast. So it is, it is something I have questions about and that I will have to learn about to figure out how to properly make sure that um, you know, because this law does place the onus on the owner also to comply with the doc correct documentation from the tenants and make sure that they're not lying about their income. And um, it does give me some trepidation, but I figured that working with the city over the course of them adopting this law, I believe I was told I was the first person to actually trigger it. So I think that's why there aren't a ton of answers yet, but hopefully over time, um, I will turn to the city for guidance where needed in, in terms of how to best uh, to make it work. So uh, I started by adding the sixth unit so that I would make sure that I, you know, could could even financially make this development work under those terms in some fashion. And then I figure the rest will be a collaborative effort of some kind. If you could take really good notes and make a pamphlet about that. That's all. <laughs> I, I'll do my best. It, it'll be it'll be a learning curve, but I think you know some protocols will be established over time for how to actually implement this, and then it will be easier <laughs> in the future. Well, you you were prepared for that question, so I I, I appreciate your answer to that. Thank you, so Courtney. I, I also I work for Rupco. I work with Chuck, so oh, okay. you can also reach out to me. <laughs> yeah, I was told to call him when I I spoke to the zoning officer, Eric. And he recommended that I speak to them because I was asking the same questions you're asking, which is how am I going to do right. this? I've never worked with affordable housing candidates before. I don't want to do something right. wrong. Um, you know, so I, I think, but there will be time because this development is uh, slated to happen a bit later than the current main house. And um, hopefully by the time it's actually finished, there will be more clarity and guidance and I will, you know, have figured out my methodology, so. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. You too. Okay. Um, let's see here. Old business. Uh, as Sue mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, item number eight is uh, off the agenda for tonight. Uh, we have already talked about item number nine. Okay. Uh, do we want to go into the Hillcrest Avenue one first? Yeah. Well, we have we have two. I, I think that we could probably maybe handle with the with applicants before we get involved in the referral from the council. So, okay. I got someone here from Fifteen Down Street, which is the performance bond reduction. Hi. Tariq, you're, uh, I see you, but you're muted. Can I mute yourself, please? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is, I gotta go all the way to the back of this thing, so here, hold on. Number 11. Okay. All right, this is for a bond release for 15 Down Street, the request for release of performance bond uh, provided in connection with construction of a place of worship, section block and lot is 56.25-1-23, secret determination, zone C3, ward four, Muslim Association of Ulster County Incorporated is the owner. Uh, for the record, sir, can you, uh, re the representative of, of uh, 15 Down Street, can you state your name for the record? Daddy Guja. How are you doing tonight? Good, how are you, sir? Good. Um, so where are we with, with this? They see we, they're looking to have uh, the $15,000 uh, 
taken out, taken out there. Where, where, are, where are you with everything? Uh, um, well, you have a copy of the report um, that I yes. did when I visited the site. I met with Tariq, and um, you have a copy of this as well. Um, I don't know if you have any comments on it. There are some outstanding issues and some inconsistencies uh, with the approved plan. Um, at this time, I would recommend that um, the applicants work on making some plan adjustments to address uh, some of the issues. Um, probably yes. the most significant really is the, the stormwater drainage in that's the right. Um, that's that's the big ticket item because uh, there was a proposed dry well to be placed out front uh, that was never installed. Um, however, it appears from the site inspection that a sewer line is directly where the dry well was supposed to be. Um, so we would need really a drawing of showing the exact placement as built construction of where the, all the utilities are run just to confirm their locations um, and then somehow address the stormwater runoff because it, it simply heat drains, the entire front basically heat drains out to the street. Sarah, are you in the middle of, of changing engineers for, for, all, for all of this? No, no I didn't. Okay. I, okay. I don't know how the contractor missed that, that drainage. You put two on the back. I think plan car for two. I think you put two on the back, didn't put okay. on the front. So okay. I will talk to the Mike North, the engineer, and see how we can uh, address this. Okay. I just need a little bit of time to. Okay. Because, you know, I got to tell you, this, this has been off my radar for, I mean, <laughs> we have been August 2013 is when we uh, were, yes. were last dealing with this. So, um, I guess I was unaware that there were some issues there outstanding. I forgot all about the performance bond myself. So, um, so you can, you can work with staff to yes. remedy this. And then, um, yeah. when, when they're happy, when they're, everybody's satisfied, we can yeah. come back and, we can, and, and we'll, we'll certainly discuss releasing that bond. Right. No, no problem. I will address all the issue. No problem. Okay. Um, just um, Tariq, with the other issues, I don't know if you had any questions on some of the other comments that I made. I know we talked all the time we were there, so. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I got all of them. I never take care of it. About the garage, I will talk to the building inspector, see right. how, how they can. Okay, good. But I, will, I will take care. I just need a little bit of time. I will okay. take care of all the issues. I mean, so you have a temporary CFO for that? Uh, I got the CEO, not the temporary. Okay. Okay. But I will, I will uh, fix all these, whatever left the, the problems. Okay. okay. I will take it, I promise. All right. And I can get the money back till then. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it looks nice back there. Uh, you know, it's been a while right. since I've driven by, but it's uh, it's a beautiful place back there. Yeah, nice. It took some time, but it wasn't my part. It's when we talk about this building. Everybody promised they're going to contribute. And then as soon as we got things started, everybody disappeared. So it took yeah. some time to finish it. So, but I thank God I got it done. So that's the <laughs> Okay. Well, um, it's good to see you. And, uh, you know, I hope to see you at the next meeting. We'll get some of this stuff taken care of or, yep. or you know. Um, yes. But I'm good to see you. And I'm glad you're going to be taking care of that, uh, working yeah. with staff. That. Thank you so much. Good night. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah, we're going to are we tabling this thing, Sue? Would you? We need a motion to table. Um, That's what we're about to do. Yeah. Okay. Um, so at this time, I'll make a motion that we table item number eleven. Uh, the applicant uh, will take care of the outstanding issues with staff and come back when those are completed to discuss release of the performance bond. So that's a motion. I have a second on that. Second. Second Go by Charles Blackwell. And Robert is back for this one, right? Yes, he is. Okay. Um, Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco? Yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Kevin Roach? Yes. Okay, that is adopted. Thank you, sir. Have thank a good you, evening. Thank you. No, Sam, to use that. Thank you very yeah. much. All right. All right. Item, you want to move to item number 12 then, Sue? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, item 12 is a curb cut 
36 Hillcrest Avenue, request to install a second curb cut. Section block and lot is 56.39-4-19. Secret determination zone R1, Ward 3. Sean Paul Pillsworth is the applicant owner. Mr. Pillsworth, are you here? Yep, right here. All right. You got your dad with you tonight or no? <laughs> no. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I don't know where he is. All right. Um, how you doing tonight? Good. How are you? Good. Um, all right. So tell us what you want to do here. Okay. So, uh, you know, full disclosure, it's already been done. Uh, what happened was uh, my family and I, well, my wife and my kids were away and my father-in-law uh, decided because we bought this house uh, last July that he would, um, you know, do a gift. He did some yard work and stuff. And he installed a gravel uh, sort of driveway. If you're looking at the house on the right side, um, kind of parallel to the driveway we already have. Okay. Uh, so that's not, you know, as I, I called up the planning board and I, I wrote an email that I, I understand that's not the way to go about it. So I am just trying to go backwards and provide the information to kind of remedy this or, or figure out a way to remedy it. Okay. And the reason I asked if your dad was there tonight with you, he was a member of the planning board. So that's why I, that's why I threw that in. There, so, all right. So anyways. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, all right. Um, Sue, where, where are we with this? Um, I mean, we've reviewed it. Um, Kyle has been in contact uh, with Sean and um, basically um, they do need to get a variance um, from the ZBA because they can't uh, make the depth um, without you know, removing um, some vegetation, a pretty significant tree. So um, they've, they know that they're gonna make that application. Um, I, we see no reason why it can't go through this board with that as a condition. Okay, and that's really the only outstanding issue then, right? It's gravel, um, so probably board policy five and okay. so it be applied here. Um, okay, Any, anybody else on the board? Okay, um, under secret, it's a type two action, so no further review of the board is required. So at this time, we'll make a motion that we approve item number 12 uh, with the condition that the Zoning Board of Appeals uh, will approve uh, their, apple, their end of it. That is a motion. Do I have a second? Evan Roach, second. Evan Roach with a second. Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco? Yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Kevin Roach? Yes. Okay, that is approved. Mr. Pillsworth, good luck. Thank you for showing up tonight. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, take care. Bye -bye. Okay. Um, moving on to our last item here. Uh, this is the rezoning recommendation. Yes. There's a, a referral from the Common Council to amend the zoning code, section 405-9 parens C, parens D, and parens H, accessory apartments in section 405-34 in parens J, off-street parking and loading. Um, so we have a new submission, Sue, from, or I don't know if Dan wants to weigh in on this now. Um, Yes, um, Dan, you, I don't know. Um, I'm hoping that all of the board members were able to see Dan's email this afternoon. Um, it included not only the Ulster County Planning Board comments, which came back today, um, but it also included um, a, rev a revised or new legislation that is being considered um, and being presented, I guess, to laws and rules. Um, it's not what was referred to this board, uh, however. Um, so all of the staff notes are only reflect um, the questions that were referred and prior discussions. All right. So, so the recent, re the, the newest referral, can we, I don't know if we can call it a referral, did, did it come from the Common Council itself? 
Uh, no. Technically, it's an amendment to the previous referral and it's a response to the county's objection. Um, it also um, was um, you know, disclosed previously that um, there were members of the council that wish, wish to expand upon uh, the previous um, suggestion um, in response to the state legislation. And that's basically what this is. It's the council um, considering adopting pretty much wholesale um, the proposal that is currently before the state assembly. Dan, this is Wayne. Do you know when, I mean, I mean, it's hard to maybe predict, but when the state proposal will actually be be brought down to become law and for everybody to have to abide by? Do you know, what's the time frame on that? Uh, the council has basically decided that they're not going to base their decision on whether or not the state adopts the legislation that based upon the current housing crisis in the county, based upon the comments from county planning, uh, based upon um, research by our housing department and the sentiment of the various members of the common council that they wish to move forward on this independent of the state legislation. Okay. Anybody else? Have any, anybody have any comment on it or questions? Robert, are you there? I'm here. I'll be honest with you. I did not see today's email because it came in to me about quarter after five and I was having dinner before this meeting. So I, I just, I have not looked at it. I don't know if other board members had a chance to look at it or. You know, which oh. email are we referencing? This is Matt, because I saw one comment like 314 this afternoon. Was there another? Uh, I had sent an email, I believe, on Thursday or Friday of last week, notifying the planning board um, that the council was likely moving in this direction. Um, an additional email was sent today um, indicating that um, the council has actually um, posted and determined that they are going to consider um, an adoption of the state legislation at Wednesday's meeting. I believe that's the email that you're referring to that you received today. In that email, I also included a copy of the county response to the initial referral. Wait, Dan, and you Rob, said there was an When email you said you didn't receive today, week. did you receive Fridays? Rob? I received, I received an email today. What came out for, I got the, I got the, your email last week, but then I received another email today. Okay, yeah. Now, Dan? Dan? Yes. You're stating that the council is basically in a position to adopt the state's um, version Wednesday. Is the that council correct? is considering moving the, the laws and rules committee is considering moving forward with the state legislation on Wednesday. Yes. Without any comments from us or do, does it, do our comments matter or? Well, I mean, they're certainly going to consider whatever comments um, you make. Um, they will determine whether or not um, they agree with you. And if there are six votes on the council of nine, um, they can move forward um, despite your objection. Um, the variable here is that the county um, in their response objected to the council doing less than what the state is recommending. Um, so, the council, if they act in accordance with the county recommendation, basically um, will be adopting um, the state legislation as, um, you know, in essence, an amendment to the referral that was made to you last month. But my, but my understanding is the state legislation has not been vetted, discussed, nor approved in Albany, and we're the only municipality that's actually looking at this, correct? Well, we're certainly not the only municipality that's looking at it. Municipalities all across the state are looking at it. And 
responding in their own way to documented housing emergencies and are working with their county legislators and you know their other agencies to develop solutions to you know a, a documented and acknowledged crisis. This is Kevin. I did note though uh, a couple of things when I was reading the county um, recommendations earlier. They did agree with the required modification. They said that we would add that such a definition should include the need for the owner to occupy one of the units on the lot. Is that part of the state um, concept or the state just throwing that out too? You know, Dan? The state legislation, Kevin, the state legislation requires owner occupancy for the first year after the initial occupancy of the ADU. Thereafter, um, it can be rented um, in a non-owner occupied um, scenario um, under our collateral landlord registration law. Um, the property owner would then have to register through the building department and follow um, the provisions of that statute. So the county is saying that we, that they suggest we, I think, keep with the owner occupied occupancy of the one unit, if I'm reading that correctly, which I certainly support. Well, actually, the county didn't um, specifically say we should keep the owner occupied. Um, they would not object if we did. So as we would add that such a definition should include the need for the owner to occupy one of the units on the lot. The required modification of the recommendation of the definition of accessory apartment. Okay. Our, you know, written recommendation in front of me. Um, the council will be considering it as it, you know, is presented to them. Again, the state legislation specifically provides the first year would be owner occupancy. Thereafter, it would not have to be. Yeah. I like I like the county's thought. Dan, how does this latest email from you um, vary from what was originally presented to us at the last meeting? Is there, what, what's can you what, what, what's going on there? What do you mean? What's going on there? No, well, the the latest the latest email that we got today is is there some variation as to what was presented to the board for our consideration at the last meeting? I mean, uh, um, what was presented to the board at the last meeting was a um, significantly pared down. Um, proposal that would loosen but not remove all impediments to accessory dwelling units. After, and if you recall at that uh, meeting, um, it was also discussed that a far more you know, sweeping uh, proposal was pending in front of the state and um, would be considered and discussed by the council in the context of you know, this you know, global discussion. Um, you would ask for more time to address those limited um, expansions. Um, subsequent to that, the uh, Laws and Rules Committee met. Um, there was a presentation in front of Laws and Rules uh, by um, the Osa County Planning Director um, who explained the benefits um, of accessory dwelling units, um, uh, tied it directly to the um, housing emergency throughout the state of New York. Um, and basically explained to the committee that the county was supporting the city going significantly further than was originally proposed by the one individual alderman. Uh, as a result of that, there was further discussion amongst the council members, um, further deliberation, and um, the council um, basically directed that um, you know, we provide a, um, a local version of the state legislation um, that would um, comply with the suggestions and um, the information that was provided by Mr. Doyle. Um, and the document you have in front of you is the result of that request. Okay. So it, Wayne, I think um, the, the document we received last month or the month before was just a slight change to the current zoning, uh, the current special permit requirement. 
And this is a complete uh, change from that. This would be completely new legislation with no requirement for a special permit or planning board review, um, removal of owner occupancy, um, removal of size requirements. And that's just basically mirroring what the state is going to be coming down with. Am I correct with that? What the state is proposing, who knows whether or not they're going to adopt it and um, when they would adopt it. The council members, um, a number of the council members believe that, um, again, this should proceed completely independent of whether or not the state ultimately um, adopts the legislation because Again, we have a crisis, a crisis that needs to be addressed and waiting for the state to act is not in the interest of the community. That's yeah. the position that uh, at least a significant portion of the council um, has taken at this juncture. Whether or not it's a majority of the council, whether it's a super majority of the council remains to be seen. Um, they will continue deliberating on Wednesday night. Dan? Yeah. The council just passed within recent months, they're spending over half a million dollars for a zoning consultant. Was this consultant involved in any of this legislation or how this is gonna impact the zoning code? And I mean, it just feels like this is being pushed and rushed so much yet they just hired somebody to look at our entire zoning code and give suggestions. So I'm, I'm just confused. Well, first of all, the, the zoning revision process is supposed to be focusing on a form-based code in any event, which is certainly consistent with moving away from use requirements and use restrictions. So this is fully consistent with what um, we've been talking about with zoning for years. Um, you know, the council is gonna have to decide whether, um, you know, they wanna wait um, another two years for this process to uh, be completed to give relief um, to you know, a community in crisis. Again, that's not my decision to make. Um, it's the decision of the council members given the information that's in front of them. They do not believe, or at least a significant portion of them do not believe that we can wait another two years. And it's certainly a, you know, a process that has been underway for um, you know, probably five to six years at this point. I, I don't necessarily think that they would have to wait for the full two years for the entire zoning ordinance to be redone, but I think it certainly would be um, prudent to reach out to them and, and ask them for any any comment um, as as the committee and the, and the full council are reviewing this. Especially from a company that's supposed to look at zoning codes across the state and all different municipalities, they might have good insight. Dan, I have a question about what zone. I don't think it was clear about what zones this will be allowed in. I see we're we're talking about allowing in all zones. All zones, yes, yeah, straight across the city. So, but for single-family homes in all zones, correct? all residences throughout the city. So if I have a three family, I can have an accessory apartment? Yes. Making it a four family? Assuming that it complies with the state building code and satisfies the building department uh, through a ministerial review process. Okay, because that's contrary to the Ulster County Planning Board comment. And that would also be contrary to what staff is recommending. So Wayne, I saw that staff sent some notes on this. Is this something that we should just go through? Look at what the notes are and where the board feels or? Okay. Um, the, this is the ones with the, with, the, with the color here, right? The different colors? The blue. The blue are stat. The red show um, some proposals, and then the blue at the end of the um, changes are what we recommended. Based in the again, 
these are not based on what you just received today. Um, we did not have that at our disposal to review. Um, so the red, the, the black and the red at the beginning is what we did re receive as a referral. And then the blue is just recommendations and, you know, thoughts going forward. So for purposes of discussion, I think you could skip to the blue sections. The full blue, because I see in accessory apartments, there's a blue A, there's a blue B. The rest of the paragraph is black. We're skipping down to the blue, full blue? Yes. Yes. The recommendations area? Yes. Correct. Okay. All right. Um, so do you want to go ahead? Go ahead, Robert. I was just going to say, Wayne, I think the first note we kind of discussed at the last board meeting where we looked at difference in, in age of dwellings and, and that had 1982. And I, I think the board generally agreed that we didn't, that really didn't matter to us that right. that could be removed. And what about the apartment size? Because the, the I think the legislation just makes it that it has to meet minimum size for, for habitable spaces and as far as the New York State Building Code. Is that, I think that's, Dan, is that correct? That's correct. I made my thoughts known last meeting, but some of the other board members were going to read it and, and, and make comments. So I would kind of defer to them. Yeah. So do you, let's go down to the recommendations then, Sue. Yeah, I mean, their their staff has presented what we think. Um, I'll ask the board members, do they have any thoughts on any of those comments? I mean, um, obviously, we have no objection to the uh, removal of the building age requirement. Um, we recommended against the second portion of that change, um, keeping the minimum, keeping a minimum size um for a single family to be you know for it to be converted but again okay. now we're talking that this is going into different zones so how that's going to be applied i don't know um we didn't really think about that because it was presented originally as only going to where this is allowed as yeah. special use permit which is in the um only the single family districts. And that does not include triple R, right? That's not. Yeah, triple R, double R, and R1 are okay. single family zones. Okay. So, and they're currently allowed in those zones, the accessory. Currently right. allowed by special permit. Okay. Yes. All with right. conditions. But now, and that, what we reviewed, the special permit was going to stay. Now it's no longer going to be a requirement. It's going to be almost an as of right. Um, what's also removed is that it's across the board, all, all residential zones, not just single family. Mm -hmm. And there is no minimum size single family dwelling requirement any longer. So all of that's been taken away, which wasn't part of the original. And that's, I think, what Kyla was getting at, that there's a lot of changes that have been made from what we originally were presented so if we i mean if we can boil down what we you know when this is you know when the state finally comes down with their their you know their proposal and the city has acted on it when we boil it down what what will be the role of the planning board with accessory dwelling units in the end but what if we could just you know what i can't answer that state is going to adopt, first of all. Um, and right now, um, it's taking out what's what I saw this afternoon, no longer requires special use permit. Right. There may be a requirement for site plan at some point, but that's not clear in anything that I've seen yet. As of that, it's, it has right. not been defined. Right. There would be no requirement for planning board review for the construction of an accessory dwelling unit um, for a pre-existing structure. 
the planning board would have to review site plan, it would have to uh, do a site plan review for a new, um, a new building. Um, however, the site plan review um, is limited to the new building and um, not the accessory unit. Dan, I know, Dan, can you tell me where that is in the new language you showed us today? Where what is? Where what you just said, where it would go to the planning board. Because typically, you know, building a, a single family house in a, in a residential district does not go to the planning board. And okay. I don't, so I don't see it. Okay. In, under, in under section um, Roman numeral five, small Roman numeral four, if the permit application to create an accessory dwelling unit is submitted with a permit application to create a new residential dwelling on the lot, the building safety division may delay acting on the permit application for the ADU until the permitting agency acts on the permit application to create the new dwelling. But the application to create the ADU shall be considered without discretionary review or hearing. Right, but where does that, I don't know, I don't see how that, because we would not typically review a structure in a single family district. And in those instances where you would not review it, you still would not review it. But if under the current code, if it were, it's a special use permit, so we do. So what you're saying is we basically, we don't have any review authority unless it's in a historic district. Unless it is a property that otherwise requires planning board review, it would be done ministerially by the building department based upon a determination that it complies with the state building code, the plumbing code, the electrical code, and all other applicable state law. Yeah, I agree with Sue. I don't think that's what that section says. To me, that section says that the building department can delay. That would be a reason for the building department to delay approval or issuance of the permit. That, that doesn't say that planning board would be reviewing anything. No, planning board will only review those applications that it would otherwise review. This is not, this is um, limiting and um, reducing the number of instances where the planning board um, would have, um, you know, discretionary authority, particularly with regard to this type of unit. It's going to be done ministerially by the building department. Right, so the question was, what would the planning board's role in accessory dwellings be? And the answer to that is the planning no. board wouldn't have a role. The only time we have a role is if it's like Dan said, if it's a new construction that would trigger a planning board site plan review, right? So if or, you, were adding a, a, you, you were adding a structure in a commercial district or a multifamily residential district to add an accessory unit, which I don't, that does not equate to an accessory unit. That equates to an additional unit in a multifamily. That's what's difficult about the definition section here. Like similar to Miller's Lane, they just added that small apartment on an existing multifamily. That didn't create an apartment complex with an accessory unit. That just created one more unit in an apartment complex. Right. But Robert, that's Robert semantics a, of the. Yeah, yeah. Robert, Robert had a question or a comment there. Cut so off. Just going back to what we were talking about, I think the, 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 the um, paragraph uh, in the comments, the, the next comment was the size of the unit. And we just had this circumstance of within the past six months with the property on North Manor Avenue. We had a residential zone. We had neighbors that wanted to keep it residential because they bought in a residential. That's what they spent money on. And we had an applicant come forward that wanted to add a basement apartment. The basement apartment was almost the size of the same house and the neighborhood was not happy, didn't want it. In this particular case, our code had a minimum requirement so that accessory apartments, which are supposed to be accessory, not 
equal or larger than the, than the main dwelling and they didn't meet the requirements, therefore it was denied. But you're taking all of this out from the planning boards and you're basically creating two family zoning through the entire city of Kingston at any size. And as a real estate attorney, when people are looking at buying properties in residential neighborhoods that are less dense because that's what they're choosing and that's what they want to spend their money on, the question they always ask is what can my neighbor do next door? And right now, basically we're saying through this legislation that the entire city of Kingston is, is two family and you can put an accessory dwelling anywhere. There's no size requirement, so it could be bigger or smaller. And there's and we're trying to solve a housing problem, which is high rent. And this council has not put any requirements for affordable housing in any of this legislation. So anyone that's going to spend the amount of money at eight dollars a, 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 a two by four or eighty dollars a sheet of plywood right now in this pandemic, they're going to have absolute highest market rents because they're not only living there, but they are. Uh, now renting to a tenant in the property. And you also turn around and you have these uh, uh, people that are going to be making these decisions. You don't have an owner occupancy requirement, or if you do create the owner occupancy requirement, our building safety division can't enforce it because if somebody's owner occupied, then you put a two family and the person moves out. Now you end up with a two family and absentee landlord who's renting to people and then the neighborhood screaming. And I mean, these are things that keep coming before the planning board the past 10 years. This is why we have zoning. So I, I just, you know, I, there's a lot of people that are, you know, triple R, double R, single family. They chose neighborhoods with less density, less trash, less traffic. And the, the council is just basically annihilating the zoning code. This is Matt here. Yeah, this feels like it's almost taking all the checks and balances out of this process. And I mean, this could just really just change neighborhoods in total. I mean, people are going to board up garages and put apartments in them. And that's what you're going to see in your streetscape. I mean, it's just everyone's choosing this community based on its characteristics and the way that it looks. And you're going through all the neighborhoods and you're just gutting the zoning code. And you're doing it based on a state law that's not even state law. It hasn't even been vetted yet. You spend a half a million dollars on... Uh, zoning consultants, and you won't even consult them. Kevin or Chuck? I had uh, cons uh, also the same the thoughts that the county planning board also mentioned uh, just toward the end of their recommendations. Uh, I got to find it again. Uh, I believe the one was for the affordable housing um, component. And the other, um, uh, I lost it because I had printed it and mine wasn't blue. I think I can read your mind, Kevin. I bet it's going to be on the short-term rental. Yes, thank you. <laughs> short-term, so it's the, it's um, whether or not it has to be owner-occupied, whether or not the second unit, additional um, accessory unit could actually be larger than the original unit. Third was the, um, ADA, um, affordable housing, and then also whether it could be short term. Those four topics have to be addressed. And I'm let's move, you know, in moving in reverse order, um, the legislation specifically precludes rentals for less than 30 days. The state legislation provides that. The uh, proposed local legislation provides that. Um, that's, that's not an issue. Uh, with regard to minimum um, square footage, um, what both the state legislation and the proposed legislation provide is if there is an existing primary dwelling, the total floor area of an attached accessory dwelling unit shall not exceed 50% of the existing primary dwelling unless such limit would prevent the creation of an accessory dwelling unit that is no greater than 600 feet. So there are space requirements Okay. Um, it's just not the space requirements that are currently um, in our code that are far more restrictive. Um, in terms of uh, owner occupancy, um, you know, we've already addressed that. Um, right. The state legislation and our um, and the current proposal both provide that for the first year it would be owner occupied. Thereafter, it doesn't have to be owner occupied and. Um, Again, given that we have a rental dwelling um, and landlord registration code in the city of Kingston that requires 
um, regular inspections. Um, we are not, or at least um, certain members of the council and clearly the state are not as concerned with owner occupancy. Um, I believe that there is also a lack of data um, to support the notion that owner occupancy increases um, you know, quality of life um, or increases the extent to which uh, property owners care for um, their properties. Uh, that's an assumption that- um, yeah, but then, you know, then is, why do we have a landlord registry? That's the whole purpose of the city creating the landlord registry. Was the landlord the registry landlord. is based on the presumption that, an, a, um, at, that a landlord who is not present on the, uh, at the property can designate a local agent who is available to respond in the event of an emergency. Um, and, the, and the city has already determined through that legislation that any issues related to owner occupancy can be effectively addressed by requiring a local agent or a local manager who can respond to issues. Generally though, accessory dwelling units are, are to assist someone in being able to afford their home or afford you know, a single family house as a supplemental to their income and also to allow for family members or you know, kids that can't move out to come back home. That's I think where the owner occupancy kind of plays into it. Well, I think that if you, um either um, um, review the presentations that are um, being made to the council, review I watched. the information that is being provided by our housing director, um, that while those are um, some of the reasons and some of the justifications for accessory dwelling units, they're far from um, all of the reasons. And um, there is well, a, well, I did watch. Again, I also did watch. Also city employees and county employees. You haven't had any outside consultants like the one we spent half a million dollars on to give input. Of course, our housing director wants housing. That's her job. And I'd also ask about Roman numeral eleven about multiple dwelling law, because that to me reads that accessory dwellings would not fall under the landlord registration. Is that what that's saying? No, the multiple dwelling law is a state law that has nothing to do with landlord registration. Landlord registration is uh, part of our local code. I think that should be clarified. I think a lot of the concerns that this board has with regards to this um, pending state uh, proposal to be handed down um, is reflected in in staff's uh, comments here in the blue. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, this is going to affect a lot of things that, that how things are done in the city, and um, it's going to affect neighborhoods like like folks on this board have said. Um, I I don't and I I don't think that the the, the council has may be fully recognized or, or taken into account all of these, you know, the, these concerns. Um, for me, I would, I would uh, be inclined to deny the, uh, the referral from the Common Council as it has been referred. And I would submit to the council the comments and recommendations of staff, because like I said, I think that a lot of these comments are reflective of, of how this of the questions and concerns that the that our board has had. You know, that's just my opinion. I mean, I don't know how the rest of the board feels about it, but um, this is Matt Wayne. I agree with you that I mean it's a great starting point to start the conversation to get them to look at other things. But then also, like what Robert had said, bring in this consultant. I mean, they've got their expertise. Let's use it. And you know, just yeah. being passed over. And you know, in the end, you know, we're going to have to see what the state says. You know, what what their final, you know, their boiled down version of of this whole thing is going to be. I don't know when that's coming, but um, any, anybody else have any similar feelings about that? 
Wayne Chuck. I, I can cover what you're saying, and we go back to what Rob was saying. We're, we're sitting there, we're looking at, at implementing something from what somebody might be thinking about maybe later on. I mean, it's, it's confusing. I, I feel that these notes should go back to have Sue when she puts the letter together, I agree and, and uh, denying it as written and send these back and have the committee and, and Kingston look at all of this and see if they can come up with, uh, maybe they'll like what we send over, maybe, maybe they won't. But I, I can't see opening the whole city to what could be in certain areas. You know, you open up in a city like the notes say and with, with uh, where you could have a family district uh, that's two and now they could throw that in and now it's it's three instead of two. It's, it's just, I don't, I don't like it. I think we're opening ourselves up to uh, a lot of problems in the future. Okay. Anybody else? Vince, any thoughts? <clears throat> I kind of concur with everything that you know everybody's talked about. No sense repeating that, but yes, I, I agree that maybe the recommendations is just go forward as they are. I mean, I kind of concur concur with what Wayne said. I just can I hate to bring this back up again, but this idea of having accessory dwelling units in multifamily in multifamily districts, because the section in here about limits on lot coverage, floor area ratio, open space. So essentially we're saying that all the, the lots on two family, two family districts, uh, majority of which are in Midtown and are pretty, you know, close together someone could put in an accessory dwelling unit in a backyard, a separate structure, and not have to conform to lot coverage, open space. Um, they would only have four foot setbacks. I mean, we're talking the potential of landlords taking away open space from two family backyards to put in potentially tiny houses. I don't, I'm not sure that benefits the population talking, that you're trying to benefit. And you're talking garages and basements, and then where are you going to put parking? We have snowbirds in the wintertime, which everyone screams in neighborhoods they don't have parking. How is trash? Now you have an increased amount of trash. And you and again, it's there's no affordable component. So it's going to be market rents. I just don't see I just don't see the way it's drafted, how this is going to help. Right. To me, it's not about the way that people keep their house. It's about renting to someone a, a rentable space that's livable, that they can go outside and enjoy it. It's, you know, this just seems like you're trying to cram everything in to some, and some of these districts, I think, are going to be really impacted. Not necessarily the triple R, where people have, you know, a lot of open space and large garages, but these two family dwelling units, we're talking like Midtown Kingston. You could have three families on all the two families without any planning board review. Because two families in two family districts would not come to the planning board. Where else is this being considered in New York State, Ithaca? And where else? A number of places, probably. Yeah, I don't know the but, answer to that. But it, it, is it is it in use yet? Is there anywhere else in New York State in a small city like Ithaca? Because Ithaca is in similar size to. Well, there are there are <laughs> other communities that do have legislation in place, like Kingston. We do have legislation in place to um, provide property owners the ability to develop an accessory dwelling unit. And there are other communities like us that already have it in place. It's, you know, uh, some of them are undergoing upgrades, but whether or not they're doing it based on what the state is saying or other parameters, I do not know. 
Um, I don't know of any other community right now in Ulster County, I haven't heard of any that are doing this consideration either. But we can find that out. I, I was just wondering if it's similarly, similarly being considered that it could be done throughout the city, you know, no, no matter what zoning. I was just curious if that's something else. Cause I, I do think about the space, the amount of space that's allowed for the unit. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a big housing advocate, but I do think about that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, there's a balance. Yeah, I mean, like Kyla said, <laughs> I agree with her. I mean, part of, you know, having a living space is you want, I mean, you would want a certain amount of open space at mm -hmm. your availability. Um, it's just, you know. Quality of life as well. Yeah, quality just, of life, exactly. Anybody else? All right. Um, as I had said, um, I'm going to I'm going to form this into a motion. I'm going to make a motion that we deny deny this as it has been referred from the council and submit to the to the common council the comments and recommendations of staff. Um, I know we've, we've spent a lot of time discussing this. And uh, I appreciate all of the efforts put into it by not only our, our planning staff, but the, but the members of the board with their comments. I appreciate Dan being here month after month answer, answering questions about this and other things. Um, I know a lot of time and effort has been put into, you know, trying to, trying to address the affordable housing uh, uh, issue that's nationwide right now. But as I said, that'll be my motion to deny deny this as it has been referred from the council and to submit to the council the comments and recommendations of staff. Do I have a second on that? Second. Second by Robert Jacobson. Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Palacco? A yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Kevin Roach? Yes. Okay, that is, that is adopted. Um, and who knows what, you know, the, the council will probably take this up at, on, at, or the, the committee will take it up on Wednesday and, uh, and we'll see where it goes from there. Um, we may have another version come before us again. So, but again, I appreciate all the effort put into it by all of the folks I had just mentioned. Wayne, uh, this is Vince. Yeah. Uh, I thought uh, Dan stated that, um, that they take a vote at six out of nine to adopt this. And um, regardless of what we state in terms of sending back the recommendations, um, do we know anything about that in particular or what, what he means by that? The supermajority? Yeah, the super that means that if six members of the council wish to adopt this, um, regardless of um, your objection, um, then they can adopt it. Oh. Yeah. So. Okay. So All right. Hopefully this will have an impact then. Yeah. Um, any any other business before this board? So we're good, right? Yeah, nothing. Okay. All right. Um, Kevin, congratulations again on your uh, promotion there. Emily, welcome aboard. Um, at this time, I'll make this is Wayne Platt. I'll make a motion to adjourn. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Second by Robert Jacobson. Wayne Platt is a yes. Charles Polacco? Yes. Robert Jacobson? Yes. Matt Gillis? Yes. Kevin Roach? Yes. Okay, we are adjourned. Thank you, folks. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, take care. Good night. Good night, all. Good night. Good night. Good night.